Greetings, Earthlings. This is for the space buffs in the audience. Please tell me there's space buffs here. We're going to say space nerds, but space buffs is much cooler. Um, welcome. We're very, very, very excited to have you here. I'd like to begin uh, by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on whose ground we meet today, paying my respects to elders past and present. Now, there's a link here, and it's a beautiful one. The first Australians existed 5,000 years ago. The first Australian astronomers were the indigenous people of this land. And the National Space Agency in Australia has actually acknowledged that by putting them into the logo of their brand, which you'll you hear from our esteemed panel guests in a short while, about why the cultural link and our interest in this space goes back a long time ago. My name is Manny. I am the Industry Development Manager for Space at Amazon Web Services in Australia. It's a great privilege for me to host you here. This is a brand new role for us in Australia. This vertical is new for us in Australia. And I have one single intent this afternoon. It is to get you informed and inspired about the space industry in Australia. You might know a lot about it. You might not know anything. We're starting at ground zero, and we're going to work our way up together as a community. The stats for global, the global space economy are tremendously compelling. It's a trillion dollar industry, and it's being um, driven at a, rough, at a really fast pace by sovereign ambitions. The United States, China, India, everyone's got game in this. Now, you might think Australia down under we might not have a stake in this. But again, I want you to leave this session knowing that the, the space industry in Australia is worth about $3 billion today. 10,000 people are employed in this sector. And in a couple of years, that number is going to double. And in another couple of years, it's going to double again. We want you to play a role in that economy. Now, to unpack all of this, um, I have a really cool array of guest speakers. They come from different parts of the space industry. We're going to kick off by having them introduce each one of them. And then we'll go for about 20 minutes. I'll ask them questions, which again, will explore why this is such a big opportunity. Why now? What does the space economy actually mean? It doesn't just mean rockets and satellite launches. Space cuts across a multitude of industries, communications, health, defense, agriculture, mining. Everybody's got something to gain out of this. So we'll, help, we'll work with these leaders to understand what it all means for us and how we can take an active part in, in it today. So I'll begin with you, um, Carl. Introduction. Yeah. Uh, hi, I'm Carl Rodriguez. Uh, I am with the Australian Space Agency. I have been since the, uh, the start of the agency, and I've probably got one of the, uh, the coolest emails ever, which is uh, space.gov.au behind my name. So that's, that's one of the, uh, the best things about the role. Having said that, I look after the international and national engagement function for the agency. So uh, my team looks after working with the international space agencies, opening doors, and then working with the, uh, the national uh, dimension, which includes industry, uh, state and territory governments, as well as national agencies such as CSIRO, Austrade, et cetera, uh, Bureau of Meteorology, GA, to uh, look at how we can, as a nation, respond to those opportunities which are increasingly becoming available to to almost everyone around the world as well too so just stop it there or do you want me to keep going no we'll, we'll, we'll okay. get a chance yeah Should thanks Carl. yeah <laughs> no i'm rob ruyak um, jws um, i'm based out of washington dc and uh, we're in the early days of, of building a, a business development partner organization focused on both space exploration as well as what we call satellite solutions Hi everyone, my name is Julia Johnson. I head up marketing communications at a company called Neurita. I've been there for about 10 months. Um, we're fast growing. We are in the business of making data accessible to everyone everywhere. We do that through our little myriad of modules which we can put anywhere on the Earth's surface and they speak directly to our nano satellite network in the sky. So while well, we haven't been able to have connectivity before in remote areas, we can now put this on a toy in the middle of the ocean or in the outback or in South Africa and people can get um, data to, to change their businesses and to change
change their lives. Excellent. Hi, my name's Rob Curry. I'm the um, CEO of a company called Geospatial Intelligence. So we've been around for 17 years. And we focus on the downstream analytics. So we use space to do Earth observation and then we take that data and we um, find solutions and find problems. So it's either you know, looking for things like natural disaster, or illegal fishing in the oceans or whatever. But uh, space is the enabler for us. We couldn't do what we currently do without space. And I can talk more about that later. Thank you. Hi, I'm Gary Rake. I'm a partner at Deloitte. Uh, our organisation is trying to bring the demand side of uh, the, the, the equation here. So we have relationships with most governments across Australia, many of Australia's biggest companies, and we're trying to help all of them see the opportunities from space. Uh, the thing I get most joy out of working in the space industry is that I get to hang out with really smart people who have got great ideas, and frankly, I need that excitement in my life because I'm an accountant. <laughs> We need the accountants, they do the numbers for us and they make this look good. Okay, I'll start with Carl. Um, Carl, um, Australia has been uh, involved in space for the be better part of 50 years. We've been involved with the, many of you know, with the Apollo landing. Um, we've got the deep, <coughs> deep Space Canberra complex, not too far away from here. We, are, we carry out second shift with CSIRO uh, for NASA. But the agency was set up last year and you've got very clear areas that you're working on. What are some of the priorities? And tell us how you think the government is looking to shape this industry. OK. Well, thanks, Manny. Um, uh, you're right. Australia has been part of the, the space uh, age uh, since the very early days. And you mentioned Apollo. But even before that, we were the third country, third or fifth. There's a, there's a little bit of a dispute here, um, uh, to launch a satellite from our own soil. Uh, and that's, that's a really impressive feat. And so, yeah, we have been part of the, the space industry for, for many, many years. Currently now as well too, CSIRO, as Manny mentioned, still looks after a lot of the deep space networks and communications that are out there as well too. And as a matter of fact, the deep space network in Canberra is the only one at the moment that can still see Voyager 2 as it recedes out of the, uh, out of the solar system. So we continue to play a significant part in deep space research and the space economy. But then it starts to get a little bit closer to, to home, and that's where some of the, uh, the commentary around space is more than just rockets and satellites. It is about how we utilise the information that comes from space, and so that is Earth observation data, that is geo uh, positioning, that is position navigation and timing. That is a lot of the work that we're, we're trying to work around to to engage the broader economy to say, you are benefiting from space, whether that be from agriculture, through traffic management, through logistics, through mining resources, etc. And a lot of that information is coming through that you may not realise is actually space-based, but you are benefiting from space. So as the agency, we've uh, been established uh, just a year ago, uh, and we're a, an industry-focused space agency. Our role is to triple the size of the space economy here in Australia, and to create 20,000 new jobs by 2030. Uh, and we're going to be doing this through a number of, sort of, a number of activities. Our strategy is to engage internationally and open doors and work with our international colleagues, identify projects and missions, et cetera, that we can participate in, commercial as well as research. Work nationally to help the states and territories to build up the capability for an, for an international response. Balancing out a lot of the entrepreneurialism with responsibility, and this is where we're looking at how we can participate in the global forum, particularly so the UN, uh, Peaceful Use of Outer Space Initiatives, so that we can then say, here we are supporting industry to grow, but we want to do so in a responsible, uh, risk-managed way. And then as part of that as well, too, use all of those uh, capabilities to inspire the next generation of, of the workforce that is needed for that 20,000 new jobs. Just very quickly, because of the of time, the priority areas that we are going to be focusing on as the agency over the next 10 years, and we've, we've published this in our strategy, which is on our website, is communications. Uh, obviously, that's a significant part, part, part of what you use uh, today through our communication satellites, position, navigation, and timing. While the, um, the, the, the dollar figures for establishing the space agency were announced last year, one of the things that came alongside us was the announcement uh, to um, apply something like around about $200 million to Geoscience Australia to improve the accuracy of our position, navigation and timing infrastructure. 
So that's a significant investment from the government to improve the accuracy or inaccuracy, depending on how you define it, uh, down from five metres to three centimetres down in the built up areas. And so me as an ex-venture capitalist, I'm looking at all of the business models that will start to flow through from those. Space situational awareness, our geography lends itself to contributing to the global um, need to understand what is orbiting up and around our planet because that's going to get far more congested and when it starts to get far more congested, that has implications for insurance as well as you know, service levels and service provision, let alone space tourism that might be coming through. Uh, Earth observation, uh, and so that is everything that we can use to monitor climate, crop yields, resources, uh, gravity uh, accelerators to detect resources under the ground, many, many different types of sensors that we're putting up into Earth, uh, into Earth orbit to help us understand how we can move forward and use our planet better and resources better. Robotics and artificial uh, intelligence, so that is building on our capabilities from the resources sector. Uh, we have some of the most advanced robotic systems in production, uh, full utilisation, etc. profitability focused, uh, out in the Pilbara, remotely managed, etc. And we can work with our international partners to space harden a lot of that to take into space itself for, say, gateway missions or lunar uh, surface preparation, etc. Uh, access to space uh, is, uh, is another one. So that is looking at how we can facilitate Australian businesses to get their kit into space and also to explore the domestic launch capability. And the final one is leapfrog R&D. And that's building on all of the capabilities that come from our advanced research organisations, our university sector, et cetera. And that is exploring key areas that are emerging that we do know will have a place to play in space. Uh, quantum cryptography, uh, synthetic biology, um, artificial intelligence and machine learning. And some of the things that we've started to explore recently as well too, again, based on Australia's significant capability and advanced um, uh, uh, financial support in this particular area is medicine. Uh, and so there's a potential opportunity for Australia to play quite significantly into space life sciences. So they're the you know, 50,000 foot view of the priority areas, but I'll, I'll throw it over to the next question. Um, I'll turn over to you, Gary, 50,000 foot view. Make some sense out of it for us in terms of how you're casting this as an opportunity at state level. So you're basically engaging the state level governments to explain how this can be now moved to economic sure. development. So I guess one of the early perspectives is that the, the growth opportunity that we see is so immense that there is room for everyone. And so we first and foremost would say Australian industry, Australian jurisdictions, Australian universities, innovators, don't cannibalise ourselves, there's room for all. And so we then jump to a traditional sort of market analysis, think about your comparative advantage. And when we jump around the nation, we can see that uh, uh, in South Australia and the Northern Territory, there are geographic advantages that help support launch facilities, whether they're trying to access an equatorial orbit or a polar orbit. We know that in New South Wales and the ACT, there are terrific research and education facilities that uh, can specialise their clusters around that. South Australia has a natural affinity with the defence industry. Victoria has some pretty fantastic manufacturing capability that can transition away from old, old style manufacturing to modern advanced manufacturing. West Australia already does a lot with remote mining that uh, can relay technology into off earth mining. So that, that, that's the first point that we look at. Uh, it's then really important to start structuring the, the transactions, get the first win. And uh, that's really the, the next stage for us is helping clients, organisations see how space can help them uh, gain that next advantage in their own market. Yeah, I'm going to ask Mr Rob Curry to make it all really real for us because we heard the accountant talk, a lot of macroeconomics. I don't know what that means for me, but Rob will be able to help us explain a little bit further, right? We want to get down to end user level. And towards the end, I'll get you, we'll, we'll have a Q&A session because you need to understand when you leave here how you're going to take part in this industry, yeah? So Rob, 17 years of doing this. Yeah, so as I said in the beginning, we use satellites for Earth observation. So everybody knows Google Maps, everybody sees a weather map. That's Earth observation. We're looking back from space at the Earth. Now, a lot of people think of Google Maps and it's a really nice picture, but in actual fact, 
the sensor that takes that picture is just not like a digital camera. It's actually probably a multi-spectral sensor. So what we do is we take that information from the sensor and we can identify a whole range of different things that you wouldn't normally see from the human eye. Um, so we can have infrared and we can look at the health of plants and trees. We can see through certain clouds to look for things as well. For natural disasters, we can see where the hotspots are and fires. For floods, we can actually look through the cloud if a cyclone crosses the coast and start to map the flooding straight away. So it's looking down at the earth and making sense out of what we're seeing from space. And as I said, it's not just like looking from the human eye, we can use the technology to do much more than that. But we're at a really interesting uh, development in, in the evolution, if you like, of space. And lots of people have heard about Space 2.0. What's happening is more and more companies are launching satellites. And they're, more, they're launching satellites with different types of sensors now. So previously, it used to be the domain, the very large integrators that would launch a satellite or a government, and we'd have to access their data. But more and more smaller satellites are being built with different sensors and constellations of satellites. So previously, if you say, can you take a satellite picture of Canberra, I could task a satellite today, I'd probably get it in, in 12, maybe 24 hours. But with these constellations of satellites, they're taking photos every 40 minutes. And with that, the volume of data is astronomical, so it lends itself perfectly to AWS, in actual fact. So where do you store the data? How do you process the data? How do you analyse the data? That's becoming actually the new paradigm, the way we need to look at things. So not only is the resolution, so not only can we see smaller things on the Earth, the volume of data is increasing exponentially and we need to move that data around. So we're heavily involved in STEM. We need more skilled people to actually get into this analytical side of things. But more and more we're using artificial intelligence and machine learning. And so where do we store those algorithms? How do we run those algorithms when we have petabytes of data? And so certainly this is an area where I'm sure a lot of people in the audience can get involved in. And this is only growing. It's growing, uh, it's growing daily. In actual fact, this morning I was at one of our partners, um, uh, a meeting with one of our partners called Black Sky. And they're a tremendous example of a company that's launching constellation of Earth observation satellites. But they use AWS for everything. Everything is automated. And so and this is the way we're going to be going in the future. We can solve problems that you probably haven't even thought about. It's a problem that can be solved by, from space. And so it's a very exciting area. I'm particularly passionate about research. I think our research has stagnated over the last 12 to 18 months. We need to be looking at research with this new paradigm of higher resolution, large volumes of data, and how do we process that and, and turn it around in close to real time? Because everybody's responsive these days. They want to know what's going on now. So I think there's lots of opportunities for people in the audience here to get involved. Great. Thank you, Rob. Now, Black Sky is a US company, many of you might be aware. But right here in Australia, we also have Miriota, who are in the business of launching satellites. We'll get Julia to explain a little bit more about what she's been up to. Yeah, so my role as marketing communications manager is to communicate what we do, our, our deep technology, to our stakeholders, which can vary from school children to our partners, to our customers, to our investment investors what we do in a really simple way and an effective way to do that is explaining the end user scenarios so uh, it's quite varied that the industries that we service it could be anything from putting one of these on um, a rhino in South Africa it's a big issue in terms of killing rhinos in South Africa and it's really hard to track them because there's no connectivity there another use case um, which is quite interesting is um, farmers in the outback in Australia. Uh, they have no way to monitor their tank levels, um, water levels, without actually <coughs> driving for hours to that tank and seeing, um, you know, is there water there? With the myriad of technology, they are now able to get that on their phone. We had an interesting, um, I think it was an email or a text from one of our end users, and, and he said, for the first time, I was actually able to go to Bali on a holiday and I hadn't you know, been able to do that before because I was worried about you know, the cattle not having enough water to survive. So it's really cool to see you know, these unique applications. Another um, government-related one was the work that we did with um, DST. And we worked on something called a fight recorder, which um, is a device that goes on soldiers and you can um, recreate you know, what they did in the battlefield. You can ensure that they're safe. Um, before you just weren't able to get that data and because <coughs> we can put this anywhere and it, direct, it goes direct to orbit, you can get connectivity, um, it means that it's 
you know, we're bridging the gap for the 90% of the Earth's surface that didn't have IoT connectivity. Space is bridging that gap. Brilliant. Some fabulous use cases there, and we'll get into a few more uh, in a short while. Um, now, I said at the beginning that this is a new uh, initiative for us in Australia, space as a new vertical. However, I have a colleague from the US, Rob, as he introduced himself earlier. Um, we have actually globally been helping um, the space industry for a long time now. We've, we've done a lot of work with NASA, with ESA. I'm going to get Rob to explain in his best Australian accent what some of the... I what am some not of doing <laughs> just <laughs> give us... <laughs> This is the long audience. <laughs> They're a fun audience. Um, could, can you give us a little bit of what we've been doing to help other customers across the globe in this sector? And then mention, because we have a large number of software professionals, just mention a couple of the services that we sort of lead with in this area. Yeah, yeah. So first of all, thank you for having me here. It's been, it's been a kind of a foggy couple of days. I think I'm still jet lagged. Um, but uh, I have a couple of colleagues in the audience who, who also can speak to this afterwards. We have, a, we have a new hire, actually, who has 18 years at NASA, actually. Uh, so we're very excited about this. Um, you know, this is an area, I think, you know, in the U.S., um, it's interesting. I mean, especially for me, because I don't actually have a deep background in this industry. I have a software background, I have a consulting background, I've worked at Bruce Allen for a little while. Um, I forgive you. That. Yeah, sorry about that. Um, um, <clears throat> but, you know, from my perspective, I think, which is for most people that haven't been that close to this industry, it's just like fascinating, it's a, it's a fascinating time. I mean, it's kind of serendipitous in some ways that we celebrated 50 years ago, you know, we had, you know, people walking on the moon, and then we've had a lot of other programs since then, but now there's kind of this, especially in the U.S., you know, across the globe, especially in the U.S., I think, you know, we had the space barons, right? You know, they're spending a lot of money on commercializing launch, and, you know, making that cheaper, making space more accessible. And then we have, you know, NASA that's got a, you know, 21 plus billion dollar, trillion dollar budget this year just to figure out how to put, you know, man and woman on the moon in a sustainable presence to end up going to Mars. And then in order to do that kind of thing, how do they commercialize their existing assets like the, like the International Space Station to actually offset the cost and then go do those big things, you know? So there's a lot of um, energy in the U.S. around that. Uh, specifically around, I think, exploration itself. On the other side, though, if you look at the, at the Defense Department in the U.S., which is also really fun, and my colleague Rich Julian over here uh, is, works a lot with these groups, all across the DOD in the U.S., there's a lot of these kind of innovation arms now. Um, and you may have heard of some of these, like Defense Innovation Unit and AppWorks, SoftWorks. And the whole goal and mission of those is actually to help DOD move faster and access commercially available technology to help them do their missions better. And one of the things that we're seeing a lot of just in the last like six to eight months is uh, DOD's interest in you know, working with commercial satellite, Leo satellite constellation providers to carry their government payloads to do new and different things because they know it's gonna, you know, A, it's gonna take them too long to wanna reinvent it themselves anyway. Number two, you know, if the Army does it, you know, the Air Force is probably doing something very similar and they're gonna duplicate effort, right? So. There's, there's a lot of promising initiatives, not again, not only on the technology side, but even just how, you know, our government is looking to procure and access commercial technology. It's very exciting. And I think with all of that, you know, and government money and more of it, right, everything from, you know, uh, non-dilutive financing through, you know, grant programs, everything, there's a big opportunity, economic development opportunity, not only in new countries that are exploring this area, but in cities and states in the U.S. that are looking for more reasons to grow and create more jobs. And the other thing that's also interesting is we're seeing a lot of the cities that traditionally were, you know, part of the Apollo program, you know, really part of the driver behind NASA, like Houston, like Huntsville, Alabama, and other parts of, of the U.S. that are now being reinvigorated, you know, and they're very excited about kind of the new business and new technology development that's going to occur. Fabulous. Um, tell me more about the services that you're talking to these customers with. Again, just bring it all together for the audience. Yeah, yeah. So for you know, yeah, that's a good question. Like, you know, why is AWS really? Um, so you know, at AWS, like, we're a very large organization. We have people that manage. We have a very large partner network, for example. You know, we work with the likes of Deloitte, right? We work with the likes of Lockheed Martin, Northrop Grumman. We work with a lot of government entities as well. You know, we we see a huge opportunity 
to have a team to actually pull a lot of that together, right? So we can kind of force the collisions um, and we can create new opportunities. In the space arena, you know, we last fall we announced our ground station as a service, which you know, Marietta is actually a customer. Um, that's very exciting. And but in the organization, you know, we some of us are saying now that okay, ground station is really exciting. Ground station is space, but space isn't just ground station, right? There's a lot more opportunity there. So thinking about things like our specialty regions for uh, various accredited data um, and communication pathways, secret, top secret regions we have, we have all of that. But I think there's going to be a lot of opportunities for things like life support systems for astronauts, for example, right? We don't do any of that today. But we have IoT services that you know, we believe could be very applicable for those types of use cases. Um, onboard commute control systems for spacecraft. Um, putting, you know, intelligence into um, nanosatellites on the edge. I think there's going to be a lot of different opportunities, and a lot of the services that we have could be either applicable today as they exist, or maybe there's future versions and requirements based on our customer needs that might lead us down a different path. Thanks, Rob. Um, I want to focus a little bit more on the downstream applications, because you mentioned um, IoT sensors. Um, we haven't touched on big data. SageMaker, we've got a ton of services which actually play really well to the space sector. Um, Rob, you've had the most experience in this field. Uh, I loved your pig story. I'm wondering whether you'd be willing to share the pig story with the audience. A pig story, okay. okay. I don't think I can share a pig story with you. Um, I should say, I'll uh, give you a bit of background about a company. As the name suggests, most of our business is actually defense and security, probably about 75%. Of our business is uh, you know, looking for illegal fishing or illegal activities or natural disasters. Um, Last year, we, um, I had a, a phone call from uh, the Pork Corporation, the Australian Pork Corporation, and they said, oh, we urgently need to come and see you, the CEO of the Pork Corporation. And I said, no, look, I think you've rang the wrong number. I, you know, I, I love bacon, but really, we don't really do anything in, in you know, the, that pig area. No, 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 you're definitely the company I need to come and see. Can I come and see you? And so as the CEO, um, a lovely lady, lady by the name of Deb Kerr came to see me, and she said, look, I've, I've done this research, and we've got a location problem, and we've got an intelligence problem. And from what I've learned from your website, you can help us. <laughs> I said, I don't think so, but go ahead. So um, she was very concerned. So the Pork Corporation is, if, you have a, if you're a legitimate pig farmer, you belong to the association. And there's hundreds and hundreds of pig farmers throughout Australia that belong to the association. And she was telling me all these quite incredible statistics. For example, the uh, pork industry in Australia is worth $42 billion a year. And that each one of us... Uh, not me, but each one of us eats about 14 kilos of bacon a year. And anyway, she kept rattling off all these figures. And, and I'm going, wow, that's, that's quite amazing. And she said, look, we're really, as an association, we're really concerned about foot and mouth. And for our visitors, we don't have foot and mouth in Australia, and we spend a lot of money trying to stop it getting in. And she said, if it gets into our industry, it can destroy our industry. And not only can it destroy our industry, obviously, and the livelihood of many farmers, the impact on the economy is quite significant. And she said, I need you to find those pigs. Oh, okay. <laughs> and so um, she said, the, so those people that are actually raising pigs and aren't a member of our association, I'm going, well, why do you want me to find the pigs? And she said, look, all it is is to do a marketing campaign so we can target those people about how they should look after their pigs to protect them from foot and mouth getting in. And there's a whole range of things I've learned about pigs. <laughs> For example, they've got to have fresh water. They, they can't be fed off or they've got to be, you know, transported a certain way. And I said, look, I, I find this a really difficult thing to do. You know, we can find illegal fishing boats. We can find a whole bunch of things like this. Let me um, think about it. So we've got um, some really smart people in the company. One of them is actually in the room here. Uh, James, you can put up your hand if anybody's got a question about <laughs> analytics and artificial intelligence. And we said, well, what can we do to find out where people are actually trading pigs, buying and selling pigs? And so we looked at social media and we ran some algorithms and we found straight away that there was distinct parts of Australia where pigs were being traded quite aggressively. And so uh, I brought Deb Kerr back into the office and I said, did you realise that, you know, um, Western Sydney, Newcastle, Ballina, there's a lot of pigs being traded? No, she said, I didn't realise that at all. And so we, she said, can you find them, find those pigs? So um, then, as I said, we're in the Earth observation business, so we tasked a couple of satellites, different times of the year. We went out to a pig farm and took lots of photos of the pig farm, what a pig farm looks like. Uh, James fed that into our machine learning algorithms and we ran artificial intelligence uh, algorithms over the imagery and lo and behold we found a whole bunch of suspected places where people were um, growing pigs or farming pigs. 
So we went, uh, got Deb Kerr back in again, and we said, look, uh, this is where we spec pigs are, um, are being farmed. Can, you, can we look at your database to find out which pigs are actually, pig farmers are legitimate and which ones aren't? Anyway, the end result of that was simply a list, a mailing list, where she could actually notify those people on what to do. And so it's a very good example, that I, you know, commercial example, I can talk about using artificial intelligence, machine learning, um, satellites, Earth observation, high res very high resolution Earth observation uh, for a very good cause. Uh, we've since been engaged to do a number of other tasks, looking at foot and mouth in quarantine and other issues as well. But uh, um, a sideways issue on this, uh, we have quite a very good uh, office atmosphere and we give everything a project name because we do a lot of work in defence, everything has a project name. So we actually called this project Oink. And, um, <laughs> Unfortunately, when we gave the presentation, I had to give a presentation to the Animal Health and Livestock Corporation of Australia. We unfortunately left the name Project Oink up there on all my PowerPoints. And so <laughs> somebody very quickly pointed this out to me. But it was taken all in good humour. Very nice. I, th I think that's a fabulous example of what the downstream analytics and application can do in the space industry. Now, the downstream is not perhaps as exciting as upstream, which is the actual launch of rockets, and we have, a lot of in, we have a lot of space companies in Australia who are already doing this. We have um, Adam Gilmore with Gilmore Space Technologies. We have um, Newman Space. We, have, you know, we, we, we can be really proud of what we've grown in the last few years as far as the Australian space industry is concerned. My question for Carl is, having been in <coughs> workshops with you, for the audience to understand, will we actually have an Australian mission as in a deep space mission at some point in the future? That's a really good question. I think probably the, I'll answer that in two ways. One is we've heard a lot about how the, the industry is changing. And the reality is that it's the commercials, it's the economics that is really being driven down by the entry of the commercial sector into, into the space race. This is global. And so the global is becoming far more accessible for intelligent, smart people to look at opportunities and to jump on opportunities and to, and to you know, fill the market gap. So you've got the companies, as, as, uh, as Manny has mentioned, you know, you've got Gilmore, you've got Black Sky, you've got a number of other people who are operating in this, in this area, and you've got the, uh, the launch providers as well, too, who are looking at, in a very different model than in the past, looking at how they can work towards building commercially sustainable models around launch. And so that's something which is just starting to emerge now and, and all of the economics are starting to come through as part of that. And, uh, and so I think in a generic sense, in across everything, I think there is an opportunity there for in many, many nations as well too to have their own missions and to have their own capabilities. And so it's a matter of essentially working out how you know, the, the demand and supply mechanisms work in, that, there is the whole uh, element of you know, data management and data manipulation as well too, and data provenance as well. And so a lot of these providers that we're starting to see come through now start to marry a lot of you know, the history of how you make parts and the quality of the parts and everything else. So that's something we're very advanced in as well too here and, and a lot of the other advanced economies. So I think there's a link up there as we start to marry some of those sorts of mechanisms with the opportunities here for us to access space as well. And the second part of what I'd like to say about this is, um, you know, we're, we're pretty ambitious as a nation. Uh, you know, we, we're pretty good at doing uh, pretty cool things with very little resources. One of the ambitions that we do have in the agency is to actually see an Australian flag up in a big space mission, a deep space mission on the moon, on the Mars, and we're just working with our partners uh, to see how we can actually look at, at, uh, at how we can do that. Fabulous. So you, you'll note that he said partners. Traditionally, um, a lot of space missions across the globe have been driven by sovereign ambitions. In Australia, that's going to be significantly different because the approach that the agency is taking is a public-private sector partnership. Um, can I get you to comment on that, Gary, Rob? I think this is an interesting area for discussion. Uh, well, I, I think with sort of about 10 minutes to go, look, the first partnership I am going to just brag about is actually one between the Space Agency, AWS and Deloitte in the first instance and the South Australian government. Uh, in September this year, we're going to run a, a hackathon based on the use of space data. 
And so one of the questions here would be, how can you all find a way to get involved? Could I have a quick show of hands? Anyone who works for a government agency or a big corporation? Fantastic. If you'd like your organisation to propose a challenge for the hackathon, hit me up. Hit me up on LinkedIn or catch me afterwards. We're looking to find the challenges of the future that our innovation community can work on using space-enabled technology. Uh, but the really, the really, I think, important foundation block is that the space agency, <laughs> the Australian space agency, is working like no other around the world in that it's commercially focused. It's more commercially focused than ever any other government agency. And that means they're looking, where are the roadblocks? Where are the enablers? Where are the critical logs that they can knock out that will enable industry to dive through? Uh, the other important role for government, and one that really Rob will speak better on is uh, as an early buyer. There are a whole bunch of government problems that can be solved with space and we just need to be brave enough to find those pilot projects. Again, if you're working in a government agency, think about the way to take that first small step. Have you said it all? Um, yeah, I get asked lots of times, you know, how do we grow the space economy, in, particularly in the industry sector? And it's really quite easy. I mean, I recently was uh, on a, um, a tour of NASA in the US. So she was a a tour of the US as a, um, an Australian space company, looking at how they, how they operate in the US. And everywhere I went in the US, uh, and it was private enterprise, so it was you know, the Boeings and the SpaceXs of the world, um, I asked them the question as well. I mean, how did you get that leg up? And just about everywhere in the US, they said, well, when the government comes out for a tender or a capability that they need filled, the first thing they do is say, can industry in America fill this capability? And if they can, then they, they let out a tender for American industry. And I think that's a tremendous model that we need to follow here in Australia. If industry can fill your capability, then you should let it out to industry, you know? That's how we're gonna build sustainability and long-term space economy. Now, naturally, um, I mean, I was in the public service, I was in government for many years. There's some things that government has to keep in government, and I recognise that. There's many things that are done in government that don't need to be done in government. So let it out to industry. I, I, if I can extend yeah. a comment on that one. One of, the, uh, one of the really interesting things is that, uh, as you said, you know, the entry of commercial uh, players into this area is, is quite significant. There is a realisation to get to the moon and beyond uh, in a sustainable way is not going to actually take the entire budgets of all of the space agencies put together. What it does need is it needs commercial players to enter the market. That's the only way that you get that sustainability, that profitability, that, that commercial element to, to essentially rise to the challenge in a way that, that benefits everyone. And so some of the statistics that you, you start to hear, yeah, the Department of Commerce coming through is, yeah, it's a trillion dollar uh, space economy by 2040. And that's the, the direct space area. But when you start to plug in all of the ancillary and associated uh, products, services, commerce, economy that will benefit, it's somewhere around about the $3 trillion market. So that's a significant market that everyone in the commercial space can play in. Julia, do you want yes. to comment? Uh, so we've been talking about you know, commercial folks coming into the sports industry um, and sustainability of the industry. And one thing that's really important is that we're fostering Work for, workforce in terms of both the skill sets of people. So um, right now, I the last stats that I read, I think there's only was it 14 to 16 percent of graduates um, are graduating from STEM, and we we definitely need to increase that, and that's plateaued. Um, so some of the things that we're doing at Miriota is going in at the school level and taking our sat satellite cardboard kits along and having those, you know, inspiring chats with kids and, and, and trying to, you know, get them aware of what's possible um, with space. Uh, recently, we just entered um, a statement of strategic intent with the Australian Space Agency. I think it is amazing that the Space Agency is supporting um, scale-ups like Muriota. Um, it was the first of its kind. You know, we only have 25 people at a company. Were, you know, yeah, right, but um, it's, it's, it's pretty amazing. And, you know, we've both publicly committed to um, supporting diversity. Um, I know at Miriota, we're offering 10 um, female-focused internships a year. Uh, Space Agency has, has talked about how um, any time that we're asked to present 
event like this, if it's a manual, so a male panel, um, they will say no. So um, we too at Mirita are, you know, ask when we're asked to you know, present, uh, you know, what is the makeup of that panel? Um, I think it's, you know, we shouldn't also overlook the tech adjacent skills that help the um, space um, industry thrive in Australia. I come from a marketing and comms background. <laughs> Um, STEM um, background in terms of my university degree, uh, but we do need, um, you know, to focus on on the arts, on creativity, on design as well, and be, you know, talking to people in universities, in schools, that you too can have a place in the space industry, even if you're <coughs> not necessarily, you know, studying STEM. Yeah, that's a brilliant place to um, sort of end the formal part of the panel. Um, you heard it from the lady. Everyone's got to play in this. So with that, we're going to open it up for questions. I know you'll have lots of questions. If you don't have questions, um, please also feel free to share your observations, your input into this community. We're community building. This is a first for us. We want you to be friends. <laughs> we want to see this uh, room size double for the next time we get together. And we will get together. We're going to have a lot of space-related events as we move through the rest of the year. So with that, I'll open for the first brave person to Put up their hand or stand up and shout out something. Yes. Um, we're at an AWS conference for the summit, which is all about data and AI and all sorts of things. Much of the discussion has been around near Earth space. But of course, processing big amounts of data also involves deep space and other sorts of exploration. Where does that fit in, in that whole plan? That might be more you mean in terms of, of what Is that sort of part of the agency's plan as well? In terms of deep space missions and such like that? No, the, the, the processing of big data. data. The processing of big data. That's a really interesting question. Uh, so, the, the, so again, there's a couple of ways to, to answer that. One is currently the deep space missions, etc., are you know, the, the smaller probes that are being uh, sent out there. And so the sort of data structures and architectures that are sent back are highly manageable with the current sort of technologies. And when you start talking about space data transmission, etc., the technology to allow that to occur is very, very sort of narrow uh, in capacity. Having said that, as we start to move out into um, broader access to space and, and, uh, and uh, potentially yeah, um, uh, habitation, etc., all those sorts of things, um, we'll need better data elements as well, too. Even uh, today, even closer today, almost immediately, as Rob mentioned earlier, the amount of data that is now starting to be generated from satellites that are, that are even projected to go up there at the moment, I think you know, even the, the one web satellite uh, that you know, Elon Musk's, uh, no, actually, um, the, the one web I think was um, 12,000 satellites are, are, are going up. All of those are things, yeah. All those data, absolutely phenomenal amounts of data, and it's only going to get a lot more data, and <coughs> particularly as well, too, when you start to marry multiple data sets. And that's where the really exciting things come into place. So not only different sorts of Earth observation sensor data, but population data, climate data, communication, social media data, etc. So you can start to get some really interesting insights. And we're starting to work towards longer term arrangements with our partners, such as. Yeah, ESA, NASA and ESA, et cetera, in terms of how they want to try and manage their communications and data capabilities in the near future. So yeah, there's talk of laser communications coming through and the, the prototype satellites for, um, that Airbus are sending up at the moment are all laser-based, et cetera, and so data rates are going to be improving. The store and forward mechanisms for how you actually process data on the satellite and then transmit it down uh, to the Earth and then manipulate it is a really interesting. The amount of data that's, that's been generated out of the SK, some phenomenal amount of data <coughs> they've had to actually look at how they re-architect what they do in terms of yeah, omissions as well as how they transport a lot of the data down to the supercomputers as well too. So all of that is uh, problems that they're trying to solve now and it's only going to get and, and there'll be two-way data requirements as we move to advanced manufacturing. So manufacturing and uh, science experiments in microgravity conditions are going to need two-way data exchange. So it's going to be pushing pretty hard. And I think the other thing too is with deep space, right? I mean, we're talking about like the cis lunar, right? 
like our Defense Department is very concerned about, actually most nations should be very concerned about, as more and more, you know, uh, whether they're autonomous robots or there's other types of spacecraft, you know, we're going to be, we're all going to be very concerned as nations as who's putting what up there, you know, so being able to track and take action as well. So I think, I think, you know, I, I you know, I, I personally envision there's going to be a lot more of like net, mesh networks that are going to be on in different orbits that can also do the data collection, compute, store, take action, you know, at the edge, peer-to-peer -peer networking and mesh networking, I think is going to be really important too. Because especially also as we send more and more humans out, right, to the moon, there's going to be decisions that need to be made probably faster than like an 18-minute or 15-minute round trip communication back to Earth, right? that should make a decision. So I think there's going to be a lot of that too. It's how do you not only store the data, but how do you actually compute it at the edge, much like a lot of use cases, terrestrial. Mm -hmm. yeah. I just add one thing to that. That's where AI is going to come to, uh, into its own, I think. I mean, uh, decisions we've made where the data is actually collected, rather than moving data around, I mean, as AI gets developed, I mean, or machine intelligence, I like the term machine intelligence instead, you know, decisions will be made automatically in taking the human out of the loop altogether because the volumes of data are going to be astronomical. And so then you need to think about bandwidth, you need to think about downlink, you need to spectrum, you need to take, that'll all be gone. It'll be AI mm -hmm. or machine intelligence. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Come on, guys. <laughs> <coughs> Who wants to go to space? <laughs> if no one's asking, I'm asking. Lots of people. <laughs> Where in space? Where in space do you want to go? <laughs> okay. How does coffee go in my yeah. Oh, yes, we could talk about that. send others to space. <laughs> <laughs> um, we've got another question? Sorry. I was going to send people to space. Yeah. <laughs> you want to send people to space? Okay. They're possible. Awesome. <laughs> well, if you have no other questions, please feel free to come and chat with the guests after this. But please join me right now in thanking, thanking our esteemed panel. Thank you very much for attending.